Hi, my name is James D'Souza and I'm a psychology teacher. Hi, I'm Willem Vanderhorst, a brand strategist. This is a special episode of Teaching Tangents where we're going to talk about books, books of the year, yeah. books we've read, challenge books. This. So, so we're doing a, through, I actually, I can't even remember the normal phrase you use for teaching tangents. We're, <laughs> we, it's you the can't show remember? where we do that. I, yeah i, I know so what i have we, it up here actually this well you know what it is it's a podcast where we take a question and we explore it by going on different tangents and discovering that's right. ideas that's about the one. life the universe and everything if you've ever wondered what's my career about what is creativity what books should i read this is the podcast episode for you yes so yeah as as opposed to usual so we just completed season three on career. We have. And one thing we've talked about, and we talk about books a lot. We talk about reading a lot. And so as opposed to a normal episode where you ask me a question, uh, we thought we'd spend the last couple of episodes of, this, of the year to review a couple of things. And in this case, review books. I, well, review the books we've read this year. This started, now this started because in 2017 or 18, I so I started keeping a list of books that I read. In yeah, I've been doing that as well since 2007. Maybe because we talked about it. I'm it not was. Sure. I think it might be. It might be because we, it started a conversation like that, and I read like maybe eight books in 2017 or 18. That's a good question. And then I thought that's not many. Uh, so what I did was I changed my signature on my yeah 2018. I read seven books, and I thought I want to read more books. So I, I started this game of how many books can I read in a year? I changed my signature on my email at work and all that kind of stuff. In 2019, I read 18 books. Mm. And then in 2020, I thought, well, hang on. It's 2020. I'll read 20 books in 2020. So I read 20 books. And then in 2021, the obvious thing to do is to read 21 books. And I, I told you about this villain and you're like, okay. Let's go. Let's yeah. Because I've been wanting to read more books as well. I had, I used to think of myself as somebody who read a lot of books, but and I did. I was and I did, and then for a while, a few years ago, I was like, I'm reading a lot less, or I'm reading articles online, I'm watching mm. TV shows, I'm not really reading as much books. Um. So with you, the past five years, I've been forcing myself to read a little bit more. Uh. And uh, yeah, so I took on the challenge of reading 21 books. I thought, let's start there. Let's do it. We You've did. already done it, haven't you? You're at 21 already. Well, yes, I am. I'm, I'm at more than that. Well, so the, this is the interesting point. So one of the things, uh, so it's like, what do you count as a book? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to get to 21. And I'm on, what am I on? 18 at the moment. And then, yeah. So I'm at I, 29. Yeah. But, or, I mean, so, uh, oh, did I? And, I to but, talk, but, or, or and. and. So I started and counted collections of graphic novels. Yeah. Okay, cool. Large, but not, I didn't count manga, but I did count. So for example, all right, I wanted, I, I thought I was going to get ready for this episode and have the books like right there, but give me a sec. <laughs> yeah, sure. So while Willem's getting his books, I... Because Willem said this idea about choosing graphic novels and com I hesitate to use the word comics, but graphic novels, I added to my list out of, I'm currently on 18, I added graphic novels, big graphic novels that I've been trying to read and haven't read for ages. And they were, they were kicking around, hadn't read them, and I read them. But the, the other thing that happened for me that Willem and I... You've been Willem's feeling, always, I hope. This is yeah, completely unprofessional, but... <laughs> this, 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 you know, I was just, I was about to say... So I have not counted uh, manga like uh, Midnight Diner because there's really not a lot of text. But, okay. but I have read a few of those. Uh, Midnight Diner is fantastic, by the way. I really highly recommend it. There's a show that's an adaptation on Netflix as well. Okay. I think it's beautiful. I really love it. My sister started reading it. She didn't really get into it, but... I think, and I think both the manga and the TV show are brilliant. Uh, but the kinds of stuff I counted, and the one I'm in the middle of, is, for example, this Doom Patrol is a, you know. So 
It's a small book or a big graphic novel, but I did count that as a book. And I started this year. What's it called? This is called Doom Patrol. Doom Patrol, okay. Doom Patrol is a <clears throat> DC Comics. Uh, it's quite, so it's a run by Grant Morrison, who's like a famous, one of the really highly famous graphic novel, like uh, authors, graphic novel authors. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's completely, so there's a, there's a collection of his run is a collection of three tomes. I have the, this is the second one. I read the first one at the beginning of the year. Uh, it's completely bonkers. It's, com <laughs> it's completely, look at the cover of this thing. It's just like, you know, this is technical superheroes, but it is very like I have never read anything like it. It's so strange. I really enjoy it. Even it's, for you, you it's, find your finding oh, yeah. it strange. It's extremely odd. Uh, it's psychedelic. It's uh, Dadaist. It's it's super weird, and I I think it's great. And that's that's their their moniker of the Doom Patrol is the the world's weirdest heroes or something. <laughs> okay, so they deal with their their group of superheroes sort of weird heroes because they have all of them have very serious psychological issues or other kinds of issues uh they they deal with the threats that no no other group of <laughs> hero understand what is going on there's a short bit in the first term there's a, like a couple of images where you see superman show up because it's the dc comics so it's the same, yeah. same universe um and everybody's like, Superman, please save us from this threat. And Superman's like, I, I, I do not understand what's happening. So I'll let them, I, I literally don't understand what's going on. Wow. So that, so I counted those and I started the year with the Sandman. Um, so I had, I had all the volumes of the Sandman, but I just read them very slowly because it just was, I don't know, for what reason. Yeah, that was like me and Preacher. I had them all, but I didn't read Preacher them. read all so six of them this year. So... So I have twenty. I have twenty nine, right now. But mm -hmm. ten of them are graphic novels. So six, six preacher, one Doom Patrol, mm -hmm. uh, two, um, uh, the two last volumes of the Sandman, uh, which is ten volumes. So if you remove the graphic novels, I'm at nineteen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will definitely be at twenty one by the end of the year because I'm uh, I'm reading another big novel that I'm at sixty percent. I've been reading a, a, a lot of it. I had a lull around October. I had a lot of work and I read a little bit less. Um, and I got back into it in November. I started my, my um... current uh, my current nonfiction book. I'm not really progressing. It's Homo Ludens. It's good. Uh, I'm not really progressing on it. I'm at page forty forty seven. What's uh, that? This, this is a study of the play element in culture. Uh, I right, I thought it was play. By play an anthropologist called Jörn Hutzinga, uh, written after the Second World War about uh, oh wow about the culture and significance of play. It's really good. <clears throat> so it's the nature and significance of play as cultural phenomenon, the play concept mm -hmm. expressed in language, mm -hmm. expressed as civilizing functions, play and law, and this is this. So it's all this about absolutely perfect study of play yeah because i've um I, I was about to so while you're away i was filling in i was about to tell the story of i think something that happened at the beginning of the year towards the beginning of the year and you could not stop making fun of me which was the whole thing about reading books at the same time do you remember that reading books at the same time yeah us reading I, books at the same time? No, no I'm not me. following you. I, <clears throat> I said that I was reading, I was going to start reading books at the same time. And you, you oh, thought this was right. hilarious. I, I thought it was weird that you didn't do that before. So is that, no, what, it, was, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Because I was reading books in series. I would finish one and start another one. Reading, but, which, and I did, I said, which I did a long time ago. And then at some point I gave up and I just started <laughs> reading multiple books at once. So I have yeah. like, I have, how many books do I have on the go? Technically, I have one, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven. But really, I'm reading two, but. Because uh, I'm, I, I deliberately started that. And I think it slowed down my rate, to be fair. I don't think if I was, if I was, if I wasn't doing the constant flicking, are you, I was doing a nonfiction and a fiction. It's not true. Which, I mean, it, which it, worked for me. Well, you if your if your rhythm is just that's not exactly true. I, it's just I, how much you're reading. 
I know you, I know, but that's how it occurs for me at the moment. I think, yeah, because I'm flicking, I'm doing too much flicking. So I'm, I started, I started rereading Dune. Oh my God, it's so good. Oh, wow. It's so. That should be an easy one to get your numbers up. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I didn't realize how quickly it moves. Yeah. Oh my God. It's Ooh, this is another thing. I read a so bunch of quick good. novels at some point. I read a bunch, I, I strategized the whole, like, the reading list. to get, But it was easier for me to, so, for example, the graphic novels was, like, getting me on the on the treadmill, the sort of treadmill of the reading list. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm getting my numbers up. And then I looked at, uh, I read some short books. Yeah. So, for example, uh, so I had Thinking Fast and Slow that I'd started before the end of the year that I finished in February, which is probably one of my top books of the year. Um, and then I also read In Praise of Folly, for example. Mm -hmm. In Praise of Folly is a very small book by mm -hmm. Erasmus. Uh, I also read Why I Write, which is a series of, uh, and that was early in the year, uh, a series of essays from George Orwell that are even available online. And this is like a you know 100 page book. 120 or whatever it is it's a very small book it's really good it's very very good mm. it's a small book it just got my numbers up and then and a bunch of novels this that's the other thing is i realized so i used to read a lot or i used to think that i read a lot but i also read a lot of very easy to read novels now i'm, I'm also mixing it up with more difficult to read uh non-fiction books and yeah. not just like for example the shallows which is really good, but that's written by a journalist. It's written in a style that you could just eat that up. You can laugh yeah, it up. Yeah, it's true. Whereas this, for example, uh, is a historical thing about The Fool, also a very, very, very good book I've read this year. That's a mm. lot denser. Uh, or even this. This is, it's still it's still okay to read, but it's quite, quite denser. Um, whereas when I read in the middle of the year, I got back into reading. Um, I love how you've got the actual books. I don't. What? I have most. I have, I have most of them in my Kindle. A lot of them are in my Kindle. So the ones I'm about to cite, the Dresden Files books. Yeah. I started reading a bunch of the Dresden Files uh, by Jim Butcher, which is they're you know very very fast to read, like two three days a book, <clears throat> and I read six in a row. They're novels, just you know very very quick to read. Um, and the Dresden Files is a lot of fun. It's it's about Harry Dresden, who's the only wizard in Chicago. Uh, working with the police and they're written like uh, noir detective stories except that they're I, I know I'd love that I written nowadays uh, with a character that has everything that can go wrong for him goes wrong over the course of the whole novel and gets in worse and worse situations and there's fairies and vampires and magic and it's cool it's fun so if you had to pick best books so far of this year that you've read so best books so i have to categorize and i split that out between fiction, novels non-fiction non well i also read a couple of role-playing game books so ah, which i counted okay. uh because okay. they're, they're quite there's a lot to read there's a lot to read in there so i did count that mm -hmm. um uh i read the spire which was really good um so my tops are and then the other thing which I'm finishing now is I'm finishing uh, the last of the 10 volumes of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, an epic fantasy series that I started five years ago. I've been reading two volumes a year for the past five years, and I'm at the end of the whole thing. Is this the really weird one? Uh, Long, the one you started and it was really hard and then you got into it? I can't remember. I think it was, was that the one? Or is no. this something else? Okay, no, right. something else. Okay. I'm not sure which one you're referring to. Uh, it's very difficult. There's a lot of really good reads this year. So in terms of, oh, I also read Discipline and Punish. That was so good. So oh, yeah, you did say that. Yeah, I remember you talking about that book. Yeah. So. Nonfiction. Nonfiction. Okay, I'll, get, I'll put this one at top. Really? Not Thinking Fast and Slow? Wow, you said Thinking Fast and Slow earlier. I, I hesitate. Oh, yeah, I just, interesting. Okay, The Fool. Why? This, this one was super interesting. It's not like nothing I'd read before. Uh, wow. Whereas Thinking Fast and Slow is, is a collection of a lot of things I saw, I, I sort of vaguely knew about before. 
Mm -hmm. And it was extreme. I loved it. It was awesome. It was funny. I remember talking to somebody last year who also does my job was like dismissing it. Like, yeah, we know all this stuff. It's just kind of useless. I'm like, really? I I thought it was really, I think it's really arrogant to say that. Yeah. There's a lot that I did not know in the book and it was very, very useful. I really liked thinking fast and slow. I really, really, Mm -hmm. really, really really like it. And I I like Daniel Kahneman Mm -hmm. and I want to read noise. Mm -hmm. This was, Honestly, this is just an academic treatise uh, uh, from written in 1937. And it was very, very, very well written, super mm-hmm. dense. First published in 1935. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just fascinating. And I want to read more about this character of the fool. And, and I had this vague idea, not the vague, archetype. I had an idea about writing, a, uh, writing something related to it. And I have a few other books on my list that I still haven't read Mm -hmm. um, that I thought I would read. And then I got into reading some other things. So it's just, it's, it's, I don't know. And it was was difficult to get. Uh, I had to order it once. It didn't arrive, order it again. Of course, it's been out of print for a very long time. It was just fascinating. It goes through. Where did you get it? If it was out of print, I ordered it it online. I ordered it online, and then the wow. first the first one I ordered didn't never got here, so they refunded me, and then mm-hmm. I ordered it again through another website. Um, and it's just it's so rich. This person went and studied, which also is interesting in thinking of the shallows. The point where he mentions that Google Scholar is we're reassembling narrowing the same kinds of narrowing the same mm-hmm. this the field of information, mm-hmm. and this was written like in the early nineteen thirties. And she went to libraries all over Europe to document this book. Wow. Wow. Because there's, there's bits of the book in German and in Dutch and in French and in English. And she went like to actual, you know, to, to consult medieval archives and wherever they were in Europe. And, and she went to Paris and to, I don't know where actually, it's just, uh, and she uh, she obviously consulted a lot of other books in in original language. So, not only did she go to libraries to consult a number of books about the topic in all sorts of different university libraries around Europe, mm-hmm. she also mastered German and French and English mm-hmm. and other languages. Well, mm-hmm. certainly German and French, as in addition to English, to be able to write the book. Mm. Wow! Which you're like that's that's like serious serious academic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's fascinating. It, the, the, histor- the history of this character, of the buffoon, uh, the buffoon, the fool, the, you know, and she's, truth-sayer, the, the truth-sayer, like she's looking at how this character appeared in literature, in mm-hmm. actual history, trying to recoup the places where they really, what are real uh, occurrences of the character, which is fascinating. And a lot of this stuff is lost. And a lot of the stuff that she had access to in 1930 was lost today. So there's not a lot of books that talk about this stuff. Now, it's it's really, really niche, uh, but it's fascinating. So mm. some of the only leftover information that she went and consulted were ledgers from the courts. And in some of the ledgers, so I mean to say, because that's the medieval only courts, left. right? Yeah, ledgers of medieval courts to wow. say that this person written down as a buffoon earned this much stipend per week or month so so you like you know that there was one at the court but there's no other information that says who this person really was what they were actually doing how they were actually uh considerate so then or like she's recouping for. that with fiction because there's a little bit of fiction left from those times but try to 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 gauge what is fiction and what's the reality of that person who was paid this much a month to be on the court versus what is said in in fiction at the time? Uh, and this is like, it was, I thought it was fascinating, super interesting. Wow. Very, very interesting. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting character and it's a tragic kind of character. It's, it's mm. for a very long time. It's, it's how we, um, and I mean, humans and particularly powerful ones, uh, there's a relationship between the fool and deformity and the people who make fun of the people who mm. put at the side of the society, mm. but also because they fascinate us because they're weird and strange. Uh, there's also a whole side of that being linked to luck and to magic and to fortune 
and to uh there, there's all that kind of relationship and it, that reminds you can't help me, but think of Tyrion Lannister like that kind of character probably yeah uh, and that thing makes me think I just re recently watched The Greatest Showman uh, uh -huh. which is about P.T. Barnum and I want to read I've heard a lot about P.T. Barnum and I've, I've heard that there are really good books on him now the the, the, the movie I thought was fantastic but it's a massive uh, musical uh, it's uh, over the top which is meant to be he's over the top and there's a great book about the history of advertising that uh, one thing that that author writes, Paul Feldwick, he's a British uh, thinker and practitioner of advertising. He's really, really good. Uh, it's called The Anatomy of Humbug, the book. And Humbug is what P.T. Barnum did. So it's, it's, it's a mix of showmanship and all sorts of other things that advertising uh, it's one of the it's, ingredients he says it's one of the ingredients of advertising and or an adver uh, the history of advertising you know i mean I you, look, you look at uh so the way social and, media and the reason is why it and to this is well because there's a lot of showmanship yeah in this yeah and and this is also what barnum went and did he brought all yeah. the deformed and yeah. scary people together and celebrated them i mean yeah. that's one version where i don't think he was necessarily a nice guy or anything i don't know but uh, that's that's really that's really really interesting to hear to hear you talk about that the i'm really not sure about my top non-fiction so difficult I, to put a top i read some really good books the shallows was fantastic yeah shallows is amazing i read that discipline and punish was really good i think see i read man's search for meaning at the beginning of the year which was which give, who, given given that victor frankel the guy from he's a neurologist i don't think i know the book psychology really Oh wow! Psychiatrist, a neurologist from Austria, who was in three didn't different. Talk about that one, I don't think, or at least I don't remember. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, it was he. He wrote it while he was in concentration camps. He was in three different concentration camps. Well, and and he says that Freud talked about the pleasure principle. Adler talked about pursuit of power, and he says actually it's meaning. Man search for that's why it's called man search for meaning. Really, that was that was great. And then I read a book that my mum gave me about rest, which was really good. But it, I'm thinking about it now. It did repeat a lot of the stuff that I'd heard at other places. Mm. Probably the book I'm going to pick, which is nice because our season four for Teaching Tangents about creativity is Creativity Incorporated by Ed Catmull. And I just, I, I absolutely loved the way he wrote it as an exploration of how an organization and its culture develops on purpose with the story of Pixar, with how, because I can relate to all the films and That's remembering when the films it. came out. It's funny, I saw somebody, Such a great book. I saw somebody who's also in my line of work in the UK who seems to be reading a lot at the moment. And I see regularly he's publishing quick reviews on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And he he recently read it and hadn't read it before and didn't really like it. Not that he didn't like it. He thought it was okay. Mm -hmm. But given how much he'd heard about it, he was expecting a lot more. I think he had a bit of a case of, you know, mis uh, mismatched expectations. But I, re I read it when it came out and I really loved it. And I also, I, I'm biased because I love Pixar to begin with. Yeah. And I love technology. And I studied, I studied, um, 3d animation and i wanted i did work as a 3d animator not animator that's like way too big but i i, I a 3d graphic designer for a short yeah bit. I, well that's where i started my career actually and uh and i did aspire that's the kind of stuff i aspired to do so the beginning when he writes about the idea that he saw the computer and he saw the vision for like we should be able to do animation with this thing before there was any pictures on a screen was is i think mind-blowing yeah me too the thing the fascinating me the most is this idea of how do you create a company culture intentionally that, uh, yeah. that is willing to be that embraces creativity and that i thought was that's so interesting and i kept relating it to my experience of being in in my school that you want yeah. ideas you want people to be creative but at, that requires a certain amount of courage and willingness to take apart everything you think you know which is really difficult. Yeah. Really, really difficult. So it's, I, I thought it was great. I'm, I'm choosing that as my top nonfiction. Great. This year. Do you have a, and then nonfiction? 
Or do you have fiction or novels or what? I've got, nah. You tend I've to got, read a lot of nonfiction, no? I do tend to read a lot because the other book I read that is nonfiction is My Name Is Why by a guy called Lem Cisse. And he's, it's about him growing up in the care system in the UK when his cultural background is half Ethiopian. And he fell through the cracks of the care system. And he's now chancellor of the University of Manchester. He's a poet, he's a writer, and his, it's a very moving book with no bitterness about people. None at all. It's, mm. And it's one of the reasons because I read, well, actually, I think my mum read it and my sister read it, then even my dad read it, and then I read it. And that's the thing we all agreed on, is that he's, he's very open about what happened to him. He, mm. It's a very short book, very moving but no, like, I hate everybody. And he could, he could have been the kind of person that's been hor- that would want to be really bitter and twisted, but he's not. Mm. He's always looking for the greatness in people. And there, that, that was, that's kind of second, but the, yeah, I, I went for creativity in, in nonfiction. Fiction, do you know, like, I'm rereading June and oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. Just, oh. I it's I read it in I haven't I've only read the first one right I never read any of the others when like 20 25 years ago and then I watched the film I've gone back to the book oh Oh, yeah I read the hero in the sorry I'll let you finish that so did you finish the first volume or where are you at I'm about I think I'm about two uh about two thirds of the way through the first one so I I was curious I was trying to remember because I read the books a really long time ago does the movie, and without spoiling anything for anybody. Sure, yep. The, so the movie stops at about what point in the book? A third, a half? I, I can't it's remember. It's over half. It's over half. Over half. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure. I couldn't remember. And it's, it does, the film does a really good job of capturing the... I thought it did. I thought epic, it did, but I hadn't read the books in a long time. Ah. It's, that's my number one fiction. But I'm one of those people so that I'm, I'm pretty easy on adaptations. Me too. If I if I enjoy them, but I won't. I I'm unlikely to dwell too long unless it's really jarring. On like they didn't really capture yeah. the essence of this or that. I'm like, yeah, did yeah, I enjoy yeah, the adaptation yeah, yeah. in itself? I, I'm I'm the same. Because uh, yeah. I, I I say this because I had a conversation with a friend not long ago who seemed to be a lot more detail oriented in in looking at those things when we were talking about the witcher uh oh, yeah. and i have criticisms of the witcher uh, netflix adaptation but in and of itself not related to the book i read the first volume of the book which mostly the first season covers uh and anyway she was saying like but they didn't capture the essence of this particular aspect of the character and i'm like i don't remember that aspect of the character from the book <laughs> so whereas i think you and i might both be thinking in terms of the story like does it does it have this? Is the story communicating? I'm also somebody that I forget things. I'm like, I enjoyed it. I move on. Like, I don't yeah. keep it in my hard drive in my head. It's somewhere, right? But I don't get hung up on it. And Dune is one of those books that's so immersive. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> but, yeah, and I well, this is what I, I love reading books like that. I read a lot of those. When I used to read a lot of books, I read a lot of those. Uh, and I think that my next move is going to be, so that's, it's, uh, by the way, this is the funny thing on memory as well with the Balazan Book of the Fallen. So I'm at the last t- term of 10. Mm-hmm. And it's a 10 epic fantasy, you know, continent spanning one continent to the next, huge books with lots of characters. Yeah. Uh, and apparently he, Stephen Erickson, the author, is quite known for confounding a lot of, 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 of traditional epic fantasy uh, tropes. So he eschews a lot of them or, or goes the, 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 another way than what you'd expect, which I really like. And thinking of Game of Thrones, like Game of Thrones was dark with a lot of death, but this is like, oh my God, this is so dark. Like really, really, really dark. And at the same time, he, unlike George Martin, he doesn't kill all his characters willy-nilly because there's a point in Game of Thrones I started getting the experience like, what do you do? I just, I can't get attached to any of the characters. They just die like that randomly. Um, or that, my, that was my experience so I'm at the final tome 
I also feel like he's also he's struggling to wrap everything up. Uh, by <laughs> that I mean that all the other books were split into like three or four parts. You know, they mm -hmm. had like part one, part two. I'm at half. I'm at sixty percent of the book. I'm already at part six. Like as in, there's part uh, one. It says part one, uh -huh. book one, chapter one. So I think he's kind of like struggling to get everything together of all he's put apart. But he's also, and this is one thing I kind of, I, I, there's so many elements that I'm like, I don't remember where people were at and he brings them back. And I'm like, I, where was this person? I completely forgot where they were. That would frustrate me. That would frustrate me. I, it is a little bit. I have to let go that I'm like, okay, I'll just keep reading. And I'm sure, but I'm, but some of it might be my memory, but I'm like, I'm sure there's some elements that he's bringing to the table at the last book. And I'm like, these people come out of nowhere. I have no idea who these people are. What is this yeah. thing going on? Uh, so there's he's wrapping up some things that I'm like, yeah, of course that person was going to come back. I remember that. But some others I'm like, I do not remember a single time. And I think I should remember that the, whether this new type of characters, he's just bringing them out of the blue to be able to this, complete his book. <laughs> this was the book you, I was referring to earlier in the, this episode that you were talking about before. Uh, I don't probably know what you talk about. It, what, this was. was the one, and the uh, uh, this is another tangent about. I you. do recommend Steven Erickson. It's not for everybody, but I really, yeah. really like him. I think I'll my next. Mind. Sorry, go ahead. What's your turn? I was going to say the um. Did I tell you this? <laughs> so it, at school, I think I told you this story. The there's a on the second floor. There's offices that uh -huh. the teachers have, and one of the guys in the office has uh, pens that you can write on windows okay so i i wrote and um the offices go across the building so there's two offices on one side and there's two uh, there's one office on the other so i wrote in back to front writing i must not fear across one window <laughs> and then the next window i wrote fear is the mind killer <laughs> and when the lights are on in the office and now it's dark Right it, towards the end of the day, as you're walking up, if the lights are on, you can see it says, "I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer." I'm so proud. So you went into your colleagues' offices to be able to do this. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> did nobody? I, well, did you? Did you hear anything from your colleagues, or they just didn't know? Oh, he loved it because the guy I did it to, he's he's a massive Dune fan as well, and we keep okay. talking about Dune and stuff. And he's uh, he said he I didn't know how I. He was the one who said that Frank Herbert must have been doing loads of drugs and was probably doing loads of LSD when he came up with it. It would not be surprising. Because, <laughs> it, yeah, it's really good. And the other slight aside is that, you know, the hand-washing um, diagram? Have you seen that? Of how to wash your hands? There's a, there's a, there's a few diagrams. Someone oh, took really? that diagram and set it to the litany against fear. Absolute genius. And that is currently up in our one of our staff rooms. That's funny. Work rooms. So Dune is my top fiction for the year. I also forgot. I read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell. I yes. talked about this. I in thought you were going episodes. to talk about this because you were saying. I forgot. It wasn't that I just good. forgot that I talked about it. I was like, yeah, whatever. I hated that book. I thought you were going to mention it when you talked about The Fool. But that was the... one of the things I, I took a while to. I struggled through it. It took me a while. I really forced myself to read it. And so many people told me, I had to, I talked to somebody earlier this year while I was reading it because I was reading it over the summer and I randomly talked to somebody who like, who read that as a teenager and they said that was a major influence and they loved it. Wow. Wow. And I either, I don't know. I just, I think there was a big, big time mismatched expectations on the book. Right. Okay. So I expected that the book would explain the theory and how and how he came up with the diagram of the hero's journey. The hero's journey, yeah. Because that's him. And actually, that's not it. He just doesn't do that. He just came up with a diagram and comments. The whole book is about just stories of mythologies that match with his worldview of the hero's journey. So he doesn't explain his thinking. He just says, this is how it is because of all these stories. And it's one story after another story after another story. And I have no doubt that Joseph Campbell is a big mythologue or oh, mythologist, mythologist. He's, he's, his specialty is myth. Hmm. Uh, and I think if I had approached the book, but even then I didn't like it because even then I'm like, well, it's just, 
it's you're just telling one myth after another myth that i'm like there's the context is flawed for me i didn't like there's, it there's no exposition of the theory there's no, no none yeah okay no. no he just says here are the steps step one the hero leaves home here are all the stories around the world that match with that step you've done an awesome job of putting me off reading it i like it anyhow uh so dress so we've done fiction we've done i I also read the last term of his dark materials that i'd read last year so that was another quick one i've never read that i've never read that it's well see that would have been three books right there just quickly done i don't think there's a lot of pages in them they're books for kids come on they really read very fast okay fine i did i did read the harry potters really fast they're smaller than harry potter much smaller or they're like the first and second term of Harry Potter. You could read them really fast. You could read them, the three of them, before Christmas or before the end of the year. Okay, maybe. I mean, maybe you don't read that. I, I think I, I, read I, I, do, I do read fast. And it yeah, annoys I think you read my fast. wife and my sister a lot. I, I, I did my reading test to, like recently to check how fast I read. It was above average. But I also <laughs> think that stuff like this, I don't read as fast, you know. Uh, and I've then got, the the Christmas holidays are coming, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be just. Ooh, sitting I did reading. read the Psychology of Crowds by Gustave Le Bon, classic. Isn't that a short book? Yeah, it's short. Well, I told you, I'm like reading short books to get my numbers. I up. need to. I want to read that because it massively relates to the psychology syllabus. Yeah, I do need to read. Is it? Can you just get it free on anywhere, or is it probably on Gutenberg? Okay, okay. I then. don't know. Probably you can get the ebook for free on Project Gutenberg. Worth by the way, reading? just to, for anybody who doesn't know this. If you have an ebook or even not an ebook, a PDF, Project Gutenberg, you can get all the. So it's a, it's a, how do you call it? It's a community initiative to get all the rights free books, copyrights free books available on ebook. So people that are uh, formatting the ebooks of works that are available technically for everyone. Uh, such as this one. So Erasmus in Praise of Folly, I read that there because it's from the 16th century. I'll read that book. So anyway, um, yeah, I, 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 I thought it was interesting. I, I thought it was flawed and it feels really old mm-hmm. uh, and dated in a lot of the things he has to say. And again, I thought the premise was flawed. It's one of those like 19th century people that are basically announcing high and dry this is how i know about but actually all the points he's saying don't really prove what he's saying but then he's such a big name that nobody would be able to contradict what he's saying at the time yeah let alone the fact that it's like late 19th century you know profoundly like race and racist uh and against like you know women are are hysterical type thing yeah there's a bit of that going on but but otherwise aside from that there are also really interesting ideas and i know that a lot of the psycho- other psychologists worked and built on his shoulders so he he uh, he does have a very important role the only thing is that when he everything he says about the psychology of crowds in particular i think is silly mm-hmm. uh, um mostly cuz i think he contradicts himself but it's also you know i don't think there was much to base themselves on at the time so, okay. but it's worth, it's certainly, it's, you know, it's small enough and interesting enough. I think there's other thoughts that he's got on there that are quite worthwhile. So, uh, cool. and then on uh, role-playing games, I read The Spire that I had started, but I had not finished. Uh, How many and, role-playing books did you get through? Or have uh, you got only through? two, really. There's a couple of others. Although, well, a third one, I didn't count it. I could, I actually, you know what? I could really count it if I wanted. I didn't count it yet. Um, so I read... Uh, Macchiato Monsters, which is not very big, uh, which mm-hmm. is a uh, old school kind of role playing game that I tried, um, which is just about dungeons. Uh, there's a lot of tables. It's it's a uh, it's a, it's a game in the school in the old school Renaissance category, you would say. It's when you based, say there's a lot of, a lot of tables, what do you mean? I mean, uh, so there was not that much to read in that book. I'm counting it's a small book. There's not oh, that much okay. background. Right, right. Right. Uh, randomized tables we were reading a lot of tables it's a book organized in such a way and the game is organized in such a way to get you playing very fast uh, okay, and you right. play randomly right. so right. you 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 pick your character through random and you, then you manage to to survive as best as possible it's a it's a game that's very deadly that you won't survive very long 
Uh, and if you're mastering the game, that's all organized through tables as well. So you don't really need to spend time preparing. You just throw a few dice and this right. is your situation. Right. Uh, and then I read The Spire, which is, that's a beautiful setting, really original and very different. Um, the game is set in a, I think I might've even talked about this before in the show with you. The game is set in a sort of like steampunk fantasy-ish world uh, where there's a gigantic spire and there's, it's a city that's like a vertical city um, and you play and that's been invaded and taken over under occupation of the high elves and the high elves are the people occupying the city that normally uh, has dark elves living in it and so the dark elves are oppressed by the high elves they're working under their like servitude and they live despicable lives under the you know under, under, in that and so anyway you play the game is organized such that you play a desperate resistance against the evil overlords. So you play dark elves trying to organize themselves and the, who have a doomed, ah. like, you know, it's a completely desperate resistance fight against the, uh, the evil occupiers of their lands. It's quite dark and it's really original, um, but it's really interesting. Got a really good, a really good game system that I've talked about in my French podcast about role playing games a few times. And it, that would be your top role playing book this year. Uh, I'm not sure. Actually, another one that I read or that I could count, I guess, is Sig Sig City of Lays that I've been playing at the moment, and uh, and also the other one that but that I haven't finished yet is um, uh, Blades in the Dark, where you play thieves. Um, you play a band of criminals in a in a closed city, okay. in a closed city that like is kind of a nineteenth century, a little bit steampunkish as well, uh, where it's you're all in the dark and uh, something happened in that world that all the ghosts. You, when you die, you become a ghost and you become a hungry ghost that's coming to kill people. So you're in a city that's like surrounded by electromagnet like walls to protect your, themselves from the ghosts, uh, okay. which is all the the which is a it's a it's a narrative ploy the point of which is to say that your game setting is you is you're in a pressure cooker you can't leave yeah uh, as in yep. so you know because you're playing criminals most of the time criminals you might be able to say okay there's too much heat too many police too many too many other criminal overlords looking for me let's get the hell out of here for a while in this game setting you cannot you cannot leave the city and everything is organized such that there's power balances. And if you go and attack one person, then it's going to disempower another one. So they're going to come after you. So there's, you know, that's it's all organized so that you're playing in a pressure cooker. Clever. Yeah. It's quite clever. There's like interesting mechanics to that game as well. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not sure which one my favorite is. Uh, yeah, it could be Spire, but Spire, I'd already played it, so I already knew about it. I just finished reading the book itself. So I'm not really sure to count it for this year. And there's a bunch of others I started, but I didn't really read the whole thing through. Okay. So we got fiction, nonfiction, role playing. You picked another category, didn't you? There was another. Oh, one. I love Preacher, one. by the way. Oh, yeah. Preachers. So I, I had, too. well, role playing games, uh, novels, nonfiction, graphic novels. Well, that's four categories. It's already a lot. What we else did you have? This graphic novel is definitely a, a category. category. I don't know. I suppose I'd... I tend well, to I read placed it, it as a category in my list. So. I, I see most of my non-fiction... I either have non-fiction or fiction is like self-development stuff. I've got, also got on here like a, a checklist manifesto, which... I still haven't read that. I only read because someone on a, a podcast producer thought I had read it. I've been hearing so I, about this for years. It's it's very good. Mm -hmm. And he does, it's very practical. Yeah. And he does a good job of explaining the background to it. But I, I, I'm saying but, why am I saying but? I think it's the... To actually use it is, I think, requires a lot of effort. Right, more it's, than you because you're usually good at giving efforts. To, I know for I, systems I know. like that. You you use Atomic Habits, I think. I yeah, still haven't I read use, that. I want to read it as well. I, I 
I'm going to go out there. I, so I, read it, a, but... I read Atomic Habits maybe a couple of years ago, whenever it was, mm-hmm. it came out. Uh, I think Atomic Habits And you used best... to uh, get things done, getting things done as well. Yeah, you know? I used to get things done as well. But I think Atomic Habits is the best self-development book of the last decade. Really? I think well, that's, that's high yeah. praise. Yeah. I said that on my review of it. My five sentence review, not review, five, to five sentence summary of books I've started doing on my blog. The, but I think it just, the checklist manifesto felt, it was, it didn't stay with me. So I, I read it, I started, I started playing the ideas in it, but it didn't make me go, oh my God, like I've got to tell everybody about it. But right. creativity did. Right. Man's search for meaning has, hmm. but the and atomic habits. Yeah, I I go on about that. Getting things done, I go on about that. But this this one, not so much. Okay, not so much. Maybe because and, and it might be because I haven't. It might be because I haven't played with the ideas as much. But I don't know. But some of it. I, do you know what it might be? It might be like it's really obvious. Oh, because of everything else you've read, maybe or or not no, necessarily. Not necessarily. It just. I just think it just seems really obvious. So, but if you're if you're not used to that way of thinking, the 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 context of him being a surgeon, and the stories he's told about him using it as a surgeon make mm-hmm. it very compelling, and you can see why it's like it might even be unfolding into the trap he talks about in the book. Was how can a checklist make that much difference? It's just a checklist, but it does, and it does work. So the yeah, um, that's that was another one I've read, and I also reread. I'm counting books I've reread as well. Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Oh, that was a small one to get your numbers up. Yeah, it was. It was. I haven't read that in a very long time. Oh, I love that book. I love it. It's so good. It's really. I read that a long time ago. I was yeah. a kid. Oh, I, I read it in my twenties. I feel like I, there's a few books. I think I read it when I was like 14, 15. I'm not sure. And yeah. and and because my my parents were into it, uh, we had the VHS of the movie. There's a movie. I didn't even know there was a movie. There's a movie. There's <laughs> it was movie my mum's copy I read. With mostly, I think it's a it's a seagull just or um, flying around, flying around with voiceover. <laughs> Good book. I, I I really like that book. And then I read Twelve Rules for Life earlier in the year. Jordan Peterson. Uh, I really dislike uh, that character. I don't want to read that book at all. I really, uh, really dislike him. I, I read it. I was okay. Cool. If it, it's pretentious, I think. If I felt, I mean, he felt me. he feels extremely pretentious when I when I look at him. And I, I read a few of the things. I know we have a common friend who liked it, and uh, and it was a bestseller. It made a lot. So it's interesting that you. I'm. I'm. I mean, it almost satisfies me for you to tell me that you thought it was blah, or whatever. I mean, that's what I'm interpreting from what you said. Yeah. You, not really it's, worth it. It's, it's not a book I'm going to be going, you have to read it. It's, it's, it's good. However, Darren Brown, have you heard of Darren Brown? British sure. illusionist psychologist. Yeah, I like guy. that guy a lot. Really cool. His book, he wrote a book called Happy. I think that I think I would be very interested in that. I like I like Darren Brown. I've listened to an interview of him and I liked his shows. But yeah, the interview I've listened on, I can't remember if it was Tim Ferriss or some other show like that, like a long interview. It was really good. I did, are you sure Darren Brown? I didn't know. He, if he's done an episode with Tim Ferriss, I'd really want to hear, listen to I can't that. remember. If it, it might have been Mark Maron or Tim Ferriss, or I can't okay. remember which. But he's he hit that his book, Happy, is very good. Very good. And he really expounds Stoic philosophy really well. Mm. One of the things that, that he's, yeah, he's, 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 sometimes his writing can be quite flowery, but I think it's because he's actually, he knows his stuff. He's genuinely very intelligent and well. You read, read that this and, year as well. Yeah, I read that. Okay, this cool. Year. That's a cool book. That, that's a cool one. I, I think I'd be interested in that one. And yeah. if you haven't seen them, I think they're still on Netflix. His TV specials are on Netflix. That are really good. Yeah, he's I doing a new show. I watched them, them a few years ago. I was in Chicago, so it must have been three years ago. Uh, just after listening to that interview again, I can't remember what show it was on. It was either with, it was either with Sam Harris, Mark Maron, Tim Ferriss, or one of them i can't remember um and i watched the his tv specials on netflix so we're looking at the two tv specials and a live sh- uh, a stage show and uh super interesting yeah yeah he's he's very interesting guy very 
great artist as well. His Instagram is full of all his art and stuff. It's like, wow, oh, he's, okay. he's really good. And he's uh, he's very interested in people. But the fact he's talking about being happy in a logical, consistent, rigorously philosophical way yeah. that's accessible for everyone makes it very... He's, he's, he's a good thinker. He's a very good guy. Very I'm not surprised. Guy. He seems... Uh, and it's funny because at first, when I first saw or learned about Darren Brown when I lived in the UK. I don't know. My first immediate reaction to his voice and his face was like, it seems like I just was like, oh, I don't like that guy. He seems pretentious. Yeah. 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 Uh, but actually, if you, if you, if ever you have the same reaction, it's worth going past it. Yeah, it is because he knows what he's doing. He's, he's very, he's very, he's very cool. Hmm. So, oh, and the other one that my wife and I listened to, which I'm counting as having read is why we eat too much. Okay. That that's by a British bariatric surgeon. So he does a lot of the, there's so uh, many books on like eating, overeating, dieting. Yeah. I, thought, I mean, I know but I have that feeling because you and a few other friends are into those kinds of nutrition books, but the, I don't read very often. I'm the thing really that I thing, liked but... about it was number one, he's British. Number two, he does a lot of gastric band surgery now. And so that made it because so much of the stuff that's written in this world of nutrition and stuff is American mm. and it kind of puts me off sometimes, but yeah, you know, he talks about the NHS and he talks about his surgery and the people he's worked with and that made it so much more relatable for me. Mm -hmm. And that changed a lot of the way Davina and I do things. Do you have and your reinforce that we do things? That's cool. Do you have book lists on Goodreads or some other thing? I, I, have my list on goodreads and i had my reading challenge on goodreads for the year oh did you no what? i started I yeah, you can set reading challenges on goodreads i have never used it yeah it's cool i quite like it so i have but i have a ridiculously long list of books i want to read of course <laughs> me too but um, do you have is it uh is there an android app or is it yeah a website there yeah, is both i think we should do that for next year yeah, that's kind of my segue. I was wondering, like, what do you think for next year? What's your, what are your, uh, what would be your goal for next year? Do you think for 2022? God, I, I think it's it. got to be 22 and 20. You can't believe it's 2022. Yeah, I can't believe it's 2022. I'm going to be officially moving into my late 40s next year. <gasps> How scary. I'm in my mid 40s. I could just about say mid 40, 45. I'm going to be 46 next year. So yeah, my 2021 challenge, I've got 29 out of 21 books. So it's completed and you can update your challenge at the beginning of the year to last you. And my, I have 183 want to read books. <laughs> On my currently reading shelf, I've got 13. Some of them have been there for a long time. Uh, and my red books, I've got 362. I think it's most of them. At some point, I, I slowly started updating all the books I read, I, there must be more that I read, but um, there's got to be a few more. I, I think it has to be 22 in 2022. Yeah, at least I'm wondering about maybe upping that to a bit more, not counting graphic novels, perhaps. Mm. Maybe not, not mm. counting the graphic novels. Or, and, count, and or think, counting them to get me into the, to get me into the. Well, then we could both strategize and have the short, the short book thing, which I think is a good idea. I mean, I like the they have ISBN numbers, so they're counted on Goodreads. <laughs> well, let's well the categories definitely should be nonfiction, fiction. I haven't read or really got into role play books. Well, that, that, I mean, that's kind of understandable. Although you you, you you might you might have fun reading one. I might. Maybe I maybe can, that could I can, be a side challenge to read one, read and play one role playing book. Yeah. Which we'd never finished our game of fiasco, by the way. But that's <laughs> that was a fiasco. We never did. But yeah, I see. I, I really. Surprised. I used to read all the Steve Jackson, Ian Livingston. I used to read them all. I never <laughs> really played it. I used to read them because I loved them. But that were you talking about the fighting fantasy books? Yeah. Yeah. I never well, had the dice. I never played them. I never. I just enjoyed oh, them. You never tried to play with the dice. No, at, at all. That's funny. No, no, never did. I just read them. But and would it, you? How would you read them? Page after page? Because they're supposed to. You go to page X and Y, and 
Yeah, so I would I check. Would... All, I would always would most of the time check all my options. I throw the dice, check, and then maybe read the other option to find. I out. would read. I would read the options and explore. And I, it was a bit like being in a Rick and Morty episode with you know different dimensions. I would explore them all, and then I'd go back and read it, and then they'd do another one. But I would never actually play with the dice. Yeah, I just like the idea of multiple timelines. Cool. All right, great. Well, I guess the main message, should we complete? I think we can close the episode. Yeah, we should. It, the main message uh, is read, read books. Read books. What's your reading challenge for 2022? Yeah, leave a comment, post it, uh, email us. No, this is not, we're not sponsored by Goodreads. It belongs to Amazon, but it is practical to share books and to talk about books, to get ideas for books, to write lists of like your reading challenge and everything else. Or I, mean, I, I do it also on a piece of, I have a, I have a, it's on my room so it's on my it's on my list of stuff um but yeah read more and uh so 2020 2020 22 books in 2022 at least i'm wondering about upping that a little bit because i i think i can up it i think i can do more than that so i don't know i'll i'll, I'll come back with another number early in the year uh right but thanks this was really cool to talk about the i know books that you read. i just I completely don't for us i don't this. know if it's interesting for anybody else hopefully it is if you're interested in getting book recommendations but yeah yeah and as ever tangents all over the books yeah give us a like follow us if you have questions for our next season on creativity which the next season is going to be on creativity so in the new year we'll put out uh an episode with common references uh, so if you have examples of common references books mm -hmm. ted talks videos whatever about creativity that you're like oh you should check this out or if you have questions about creativity please send them to hello at james uh maybe we'll have a button on a dedicated website one day <laughs> and give us a five-star review on your podcast app if you listen to us on a podcast uh post a comment yeah. tell us if you like it tell us what books you're reading how many books you're going to read next yeah. year all that jazz yeah thank cool. you Thank you.